Hello, bonjour, and welcome, Tanshi, to all our POP listeners. POP, as you know, is a monthly vodcast that's hosted by myself and Dr. Florence Glanfield. And uh, today we have our returning guest, Pamela McCoy-Jones, who's joining us as co-host. Welcome, Pamela. So great to have you back on POP. And together we're going to have a conversation with our colleague, Jackie Bellrose. Jackie, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to come on POP. And we'll let you introduce yourself in a way that's meaningful and that matters to you. Uh, uh, hi, hi, uh, Cindy, for that intro. Tanse, uh, Jackie Belrose, and Sikasun, East Perry Metis Settlement, Uchania. Emyukusit uh, Keheu Squil is my Cree name. And I, I'm from East Perry Metis Settlement. And I've I live here in Edmonton now. I've been here for a few years now, uh, on and off my whole life, basically. Um, my mother and her family are from St. Albert. We're actually the Bell Roses from St. Albert, like Bellrose Drive and the school is named after my ancestors. And my dad's side of the family is the Bush side. And that's the East Prairie Métis settlement where I'm from. And so I've been back and forth between the two communities my whole life. And I'm so happy to uh, call the university my place, my working place now. Um, and Edmonton is my home now. That's, and I, I currently I work for the Faculty of Arts at the U of A. And um, I'm the Indigenous Engagement and Recruitment Specialist here. And I do a lot, of, I do student advising included in that. It doesn't really say so in my title, but that's a big part of my role. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm going to think about Bellrose Street in a whole different way now that I go to St. Albert. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's your relatives. Yeah. That named the street after the Bellrose because they would have been a family there before uh, St. Albert became St. Albert, I suppose. Yep. My, my grandfather, my mom's dad, and his brother actually had their river lot in the 70s they sold it in the 70s late 70s we could have had that still wow there, i know so much, oh there's so much in saint albert right that we don't know about the metis families that were there before saint albert i know that the the museum there is doing some some important and good work to kind of revitalize those family stories and those stories about Métis people and St. Albert and how they mm -hmm. contributed to the economy and social life and all those and all those connections. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. Well, good to know that. And it's funny because it I never special. I never even knew that particular part of my story until about five years ago. My mom and them never really mentioned any of that. And I remember researching genealogies and different things and digging into my Belrose side and I'm like I called my mom and my uncle and I'm like we are the Belroses from St. Albert and they're like oh yeah yeah like really <laughs> I'm like that's a big deal like we're famous <laughs> yeah. it was funny though I, when I found out it's so and now I make sure everyone knows because right. nobody knew before so I love it. That's such the gift of our work, right? We go home and find those nuggets about our families. <laughs> and the photo behind you, tell us a little bit about where we would find East Prairie Métis Settlement. Where is that located kind of in relation to, to where we're situated here in Amaskuchiwas Kaigan? So East Prairie is... Um, its Cree name is Paganwati, which is Nut Hill, <laughs> because there's um, in this in the bushes here there's chestnut trees, and so when people were like settling and finding their place where they wanted to put up their homesteads and stuff, they found these um, these chestnut trees in the bush there, wild chestnuts. I don't know. I remember picking them and eating them as a kid. I didn't know there was a rare thing. And, and it's on this hill here, you could see 
there's cliffs and hills overlooking the river. That's the river, the East Prairie Settlement, East Prairie River. So this is our our homeland. That's um, it's about three and a half, four hour drive from Edmonton, going towards Slave Lake, High Prairie. So it's like thirty minutes south of High Prairie, way in the bush. <laughs> you lose your cell signal about halfway in. <laughs> <laughs> is and, the Métis settlement this your your Métis settlement part of the settlements that fall under yeah. that the the Métis Betterment Act? Yeah, the, we're so we're one of the eight that were still remaining after the uh, there because there originally was twelve um, in in the nineteen thirties we were allotted twelve uh, chunks of land and the East Prairie is one of the eight that remain. And my my family has been in East Prairie since its establishment. My dad's side, both my dad's mom and dad, um, their grand their parents, my chapan, my chapanak, they uh, they settled East Prairie when it was first allocated. My my Cookham's side of the family is originally from Gruard area. And their script records are from just south of Gruard. I've actually, my cook always wanted to know where we were actually, like, she always wanted to know, like, why are we Métis and not Treaty? Um, how did we, how did we end up being Métis? And because in 1899 up there, that was when people made the choice, right? It was two tenths, script or Treaty. And so they, uh, my cookum didn't really know and nobody talked about those kinds of things really. So she wanted to know what happened to her dad's land. And um, I found her, her mom's, her, her grandparents script records and her, her mom's mom's name was Yasawasu Kistutiwa on her script record. And she did it. My cookum never ever knew my her chapan's first name. She only knew her um, her musha uh, her musham's name, which was um, what was his real name? Charles. They, they changed it. You know, it went from Kistutiwa to Charles Legrand, just like that, the snap of a finger. And my cookum knew his. Cree name was Kistutiwa, but she didn't know, first of all, what it meant. We still kind of, everyone still kind of argues about the interpretation of what it means. And, um, but the fact that it changed from Kistutiwa to Charles Legrand, when he applied for script, I was able to actually find the land location of um, his script application. So it was him and all his kids, they got script, my chapa on my chapa on my cookum's mom, was part of that. And I, I was able to show her on a map, Cookham, this is where, this is where Chapan's land was. And she was just so like, and also this was, your Chapan's name was Yasawasu. <laughs> and so she was like, she couldn't believe it. She's like, I can't believe you can go dig out all this information and find it because she knew all of that stuff from oral history, right? I was able to show her papers that said these things. And she was just, it kind of like brought together like a big part of a mystery that had been solved over the years that she didn't know her, her Chapan's name and that kind of thing. So I'm always really proud of that and like teaching her something that she knew but didn't have the full details about. So it's really cool because my cook comes 98. She just turned 98 and she's a huge influence in my life. And she grew up uh, settling East Prairie Métis Settlement. Her, she moved to East Prairie Métis Settlement when she was a child. She tells us stories about riding in a wagon for two days from Gruard through the bush. Um, and then they would camp in Anilda, which is just off the main highway. And uh, one time she told us a story about they would camp from they would leave from Anilda and go in like they were settling their land, picking their land and settling. So they would take a day trip to town on the wagon. It would take one day. Sometimes they'd camp halfway in the middle. 
And then they were almost at home. And uh, her mom, my top on Lucy, she forgot her her sweater or something where they camped, and it was getting cold. So she sent my cookum back on a horse to go get her sweater where they camped. And so my I just think imagine my cookum like fourteen years old riding a horse, <laughs> going to going to get her mom's sweater, you know, like and then riding back by herself before it got dark. I just think that's just the coolest thing ever ever and i just imagine like look look at our lands like this this picture is not old this is how our lands look still and so i just imagine her riding through the bush you know uh and it just brings me so much pride and joy and how much how how much work they put in to settling where we live now where we're from for us and you know Never to never forget that how much hard work they did to get us to where we are today. Thanks for sharing that. Uh... Jackie, I, I think that um, a lot of the stories and that history, that rich history of Métis settlements, the script that you talked about, the, the importance and that connection to land, um, you know, that education that we, we, we don't hear these stories enough. And I really appreciate you sharing. And um, how, how do you think like the education of these stories you know, um, that we can share, share more bro broadly. I know that it was, I think it was, I think maybe in the last, the last so many years, actually, that I learned about script and, you know, that, that journey to kind of keep and continuing to learn and, and that place in, you know, the shape of Alberta, or, you know, in, in what we do and that connection to university work as well. Yeah, actually that's, it's uh, interesting that you mentioned that because, how it how I ended up even learning those really key little nuggets of our family history in terms of like documented writing was stuff that my cookum taught me ever since I was a little kid. And what all I had to do was go, I ended up working for the Métis Settlements General Council as special advisor. And one of my jobs was to be to research genealogies of Métis families on the settlements. And so it was my privilege and my pleasure to go to the National Archives and the Winnipeg Archives and dig for a week at a time, a couple times a year. And I was able to find all these just beautiful nuggets of history for many families in all of the settlements. And the only reason I was able to do that was because, um, so I got, I got my BA in Native Studies back in 2000. I think I finally, I finished my last class in 2006 for my degree. I, it took me a long time because I, I had a kid in the middle and then I, I went home and worked for a couple of years and then I came back and I was working full time and I was taking night classes to finish my degree, you know. So it took me a few years to finish more than average, <laughs> which is fine because I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you don't have to finish in four years. Relax. But anyway, uh, I finished in 2006 and then I went home to visit. And my kids were like, we want to live here. We want to start school. And I'm like, oh, my God. OK, fine. So we moved back home. And I started working back home and we stayed there for like nine, 10 years. I didn't ever plan that. And then um, after in 2016, the Daniels versus Canada case, um, the ruling uh, that said the federal government has jurisdiction over Métis changed everything for everybody. I, if, when you're Métis, that was just like the big, a big, huge deal. And so I was like chomping at the bit to like get back into that kind of work because I was like, 
okay, what do we got to do? We're going to negotiate with Canada now, you know? Anyway, so um, my one of my mentors, his name is Gerald Cunningham. He, be, he was the president of the Métis Settlement General Council. And uh, he called Dr. Chris Anderson, my buddy. <laughs> Chris taught me in my BA. So he called Chris and he was like, we need somebody to do some research for us. We got to be doing these things. You know, we're going to be looking into all this stuff and negotiating our rights with Canada and all this stuff. He's like, you guys need recommendations? Because at first they actually asked him if he had time to help them. And he was like, have you guys asked Jackie? And Gerald was like, Jackie? Like, why would I ask Jackie? You know, like not knowing I have a BA in Native Studies and... That's basically all I did during my whole BA was research the Métis settlements. That's every paper, every excuse. I did a forestry class and I literally did a paper on the Métis settlements trees or something. You know what I mean? Like every single chance I got, it was something about the settlements. So, and Chris knew that, right? And he knew I was like, probably like chomping at the bit there too at that time and so Gerald pulled me aside I was like the acting administrator for East Prairie at that time and he I went to a meeting and he was like so uh I just got you just got recommended to us to hire to do research and because he was confused he didn't know that part of me like he didn't know that about me and I was like, oh, I was like, oh, yeah. I said, my whole BA, I, it's all I did was research about the Métis settlements. And I was like raring to go. So he gave me a, he gave me a job offer that I could not refuse. And so packed up my family and moved to Edmonton. And we, I did that for about four years. Uh, and during that time, we were able to negotiate and... Um, come to we got a memorandum of understanding with Canada with the Métis settlements and the framework agreement to start our negotiating our negotiations for our basically where things are at right now what the MNA is doing with their constitution we already had kind of a lot of that stuff done so we were just kind of negotiating where the settlements fit with Canada because we have the Métis settlements act and we're provincial jurisdiction so that's how like my education and my degree actually led me to that path of researching all of this family history in the archives for all of the Métis settlement families. I know so much information about random families on the settlements because I, w- I was re- literally reading um, Hudson Bay reports. I learned so much about the Patnode family because my dad's side of the family is a Patnode family and they were always lost and they were like road allowance people for real. They literally lived outside of uh, Onion Lake and they started to get a little more destitute towards like the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s and then they moved to the settlements and they actually came to East Prairie and they were, they honestly didn't know why. And they weren't the kind of people that talked about history and stuff. I was able to find two generations back, one of the 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 male, so it would have been my mushum's, my mushum's dad's dad's dad. So my mushum's chop on would have been like his great great grandfather wrote to um, Indian agent in Fort Pitt and said, I, I'm not treaty. I'm a businessman. Like here, take your treaty back kind of thing, you know, and because he was a businessman, he traded goods. He traveled up North and traded furs. And I, I saw his laundry list of supplies he used to take to the North and come back with like the Jillian furs. He was a rich man. It, the, all the Pat Nodes were rich businessmen. And so they relinquished their treaty rights. They gave their they gave up their treaty rights to be able to stay businessmen. And that's why they ended up on the road allowance after because they weren't treaty. <laughs> and I nobody knew that. I was able to find that out from my family. And I I even had the letter and I said, here, this is why you guys, can, nobody on the Pat Note side can get treaty. This is why, this is the letter from like 1876 or something. So crazy, hey? The stuff that, yeah, it's so so crazy. The stuff that I've been got into 
researching and doing, but I would, would have never been able to do any of that kind of work if I hadn't come to university and got my degree. I really don't think I would have ever even, I would have known the first thing to do, you know? So that's how I ended up doing that work. And that's why I'm, I really advocate for the importance of, you know, pursuing post-secondary education for our, our people. It's like, not just for that particular thing, but just in general, how, how prepared you are for pretty much any challenge. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt anyway. <laughs> and it's that whole set of skills, right? Like the, uh, so inspiring to think about. I've just started to dig in the script and in the archives within my own family, Métis family and script and that relationship. It's like, Jackie, you could be giving like training workshops on how to do that labor. And I'm sure that in your role at the U of A with students, um, I would imagine that that's part of the gift and part of the the joy that you bring to your students. Tell us a little bit about that, how it, that importance, right, of the education post-secondary, mm -hmm. your role, but also helping the students make those links because oftentimes students um, are searching, right? Yeah. Is that what, yeah. Yeah. A lot of my, so I meet students <clears throat> often, all the time. I'm actually, I work with currently over 320 students that are in the Faculty of Arts, Indigenous students. So I'll like email them and they come in, they ask me questions. And every every single time I meet a student, I'm like, so where are you from? And some of them are like, oh, Spruce Grove or oh, Edmonton. And I'm like, mm -mm, you are not, unless you're from Papa Chase, you're not from Edmonton, <laughs> you know? And I have these conversations with them about where are you really from? And they're like, well, my grandma was from Sad Lake or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, and then I start digging. Like, I'm like, and especially if they tell me like they want to go to law school or they want to go to med school or something, I'm like, you're going to need to know exactly where you come from. And if you don't have some kind of uh, citizenship or documentation of like some kind of connection with some kind of indigenous um community out and about you can't get in as an indigenous person you need to verify yourself uh you have to it's kind of funny how some people will say oh you're using like colonial structures to you know gatekeep indigenous identity or whatever and i mean that's true that's partially true but on the other hand it also when somebody is saying they're indigenous and they don't know how or where from it's it's on them to find out how and where they're from in order to claim that space in my opinion so i always advocate to the students when i do meet them i don't push too hard because it's a super casual conversation and it's not up to me to tell them if you're indigenous or not or whatever but at the same time it's like if you're identifying as an Indigenous student and you you know you are and you feel you are and you have family history that says you are, but you just don't have like your non-status or your, you know, somebody lost their status or whatever, like, or you're Métis and you don't know from where or what, it's real. They, I was like, you're doing all this research right now anyway. Like, this is the time to find all those things out. And I actually hosted a genealogy workshop in May of uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, it wasn't that well attended because, of course, we were still not fully back in person. It was when in person was just kind of starting to come up. So I am planning on hosting those. That's one of the things I do in my work is I host workshops for students that are non-academic that are kind of like more just engagement just more fun things of like so i'll bring in uh people who will teach cultural activities um we did ribbon skirt making you know and one of them was genealogy like i said because it is a very um niche skill set i would say and i would love to teach it to everybody as much as i know and i and i know an expert right 
who worked with Frank, Dr. Frank Tuff for like 10 years in script <laughs> and then do that map, that map project. So she's really, really well versed in the, the whole uh, research area. And she's the one who taught me um, the very intricate ways and details. But I would have never been able to catch on unless I had already been researching during my BA, right? So when I meet students, I try to find out where they're from and try to encourage them to do that kind of deep dive into, let's find out like your, let's go find your Cookham script record or something, you know, like really, really specific. And then you just, you have this really valid claim. And also it really helps you know who you are and where you're from for real you know and you could say oh i'm from the like lax saint anne metis or whatever like really proudly you can totally yell that from the rooftops because you have all the paperwork and documentation that anybody could ever you don't have to go show it to everyone or anything but it really just solidifies your identity because you always known like i always knew my uh chapanak Patton outside were road allowance people outside of Onion Lake. But that's all I knew. I didn't know what the story was there. Why were they, why didn't they live on the reserve? You know, and they were like literally cousins with literally everyone in Onion Lake. Why were they living in Tulabi Lake, which is just right outside of Onion Lake? I didn't know any of that. I just knew, you know, we were from over there. But, you know, a couple of trips to the archives and I was able to f- answer that for my whole family. So it's that imp- it's important for the students, I feel like. And I do always try to uh, emphasize that with them. And it's just one of the supports that I offer for my students. I, I call them my students. It's so funny. But because um, I'm like, oh, I would say somebody, I'm like, so-and-so, whatever. Oh, that's one of mine, you know. <laughs> if it's like somebody in the Faculty of Arts, I'm like, oh, that's one of mine, you know. Send them to me if they have anything they need uh, help with. And that's what I'm here for is to help all the Indigenous students in the Faculty of Arts with literally anything. Uh, and that's one of the things that I like to promote to them is to research their genealogy and family trees even if they're like full status and everything and they know exactly like they're from whatever reserve it's still nice to have that history um for future generations you know and to make sure you teach that and tell that to your to your kids and sisters and brothers and stuff right like because like my cookum like I said, she taught us that stuff since we were kids. I knew a whole bunch of information before I ever read any, anything in the archive, you know? So, yeah. Well, it's also, it reminds me, Jackie, listening to you uh, share about kind of instilling that in your students and instilling the importance of that. You, you know, I'm looking right now in terms of literature or research that speaks to how that's tied to our, to our well-being, to our wellness. You know, and and Brenda McDougall writes about that, and increasingly we're kind of seeing that as almost as enactment of, of resistance and of reclamation, and even our our health and well being. Um, Pamela, in your work with in terms of language, is there any ties also that link to make that connection of the genealogy or or language and the care of our students and our kinship practices and the strengthening of that. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's so many different pieces that that um, Jackie touched on that I think is, um, you know, this this identity piece Mm -hmm. and a lot of the work that we do in language is, you know, language revitalization is is connected to that identity, Um, you know, that identity to to know to know yourself, know know where you're from, Um, that revitalization of interest in language, you know, to, to even want to be interested in to learn um your language is mm-hmm. is such a, a sense of that what you're talking about that pride that ownership that um connection to the family you know um you know that you know for for my family we you know we have a 
and many families, the residential school system and that taking away of language and how we have to relearn those things and coming out of a sense of, um, you know, um, identity and being proud to be Indigenous and being proud to be on the university campus, you know. I remember coming actually, um, I was a Native Studies student as well and did have Chris Anderson as a professor <laughs> and did do some research actually within the, the School of Native Studies as well. Uh, it was called the school then before it became a faculty. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, relearning all of those things like that enfranchisement that you're talking about, like, why is it that some people lost their status? Why is it that there was, you mentioned two lines, two lines where, when did that happen? What year was that? You know, like putting context to all of those pieces mm -hmm. and how it all kind of is interconnected. And you also mentioned about the safe space coming to the university as this large colonial institution. Um, I remember that very fondly and being like, I am not, I don't fit in. Where do I fit in? I don't think I should be here. I'm quitting. <laughs> no. mm -hmm. you know? And then coming back and both of us working at the university, <laughs> you know, is kind of surreal. You still have this sense of, well, I do, um, this kind of like imposter. Uh, syndrome. So in your role, creating this safe space, you know, a space for, you know, there's more Indigenous students at the U of A right now, which is, which is amazing. And it's just great to see. Um, but, but I think having that, that full circle, like, you know, you've, you've walked, you've, you know, been from a small community coming to the city, going through that kind of journey, and then coming back and wanting to share that with the students you know, mm -hmm. is, is so, so great. And, um, and I, I feel that in the work that I do as well, that, that connection. And I think, I think that might be the difference too, is that, you know, it's just so meaningful, you know, <laughs> like it's just so meaningful to be able to provide that guidance or the work, um, that you're doing, but I'd like to, uh, maybe kind of hear about like a highlight, you know, from one of, you know, in your work or maybe like something that really sticks out to you in, in, in the time that you've been in your role. Yeah. Oh, there's so many. Well, I've been here. I, I moved to this role in December of 2019. So it's going to be almost three years in one month. I'll be here three years. And I came here because <clears throat> I had, it was, it's actually a really funny story because I was, um, I've always, I'll just disclose something right now. <laughs> I've always wanted to teach Native Studies, always. Ever since I was in Native Studies, I wanted to teach it. So I'm like, it's not impossible, Jackie, you can do it. <laughs> But I, I just, I've never ever went to go, I never ever tried to do my master's still. <laughs> so I started, <clears throat> I've, I've heard that if you work for the U of A, you get to take classes for free. So I was like, hmm, I should look for a job at the U of A. <laughs> and then I saw this job and I was like, no way. They're going to pay me to do that. And they're going to pay me to help little me's. <laughs> And I'm like, sign me up. And also like go recruiting little me's, mm. like go like go to the settlement and like try to get people to come to school, you know? So, I mean, that's how I ended up coming here was because I'm like, that sounds like a dream job and something that's like, I can, I've been through everything as an Indigenous university student. I've literally been through everything. So the... I have a lot of like uh, knowledge about how to help as many, like the students when they come to me with things, every single student I've seen so far, and I've like not wouldn't, um, I've actually been through what they're talking about. It's so crazy, like seriously. Um, I like spend time with every single student who needs assistance with anything, I try to like meet them in person and uh, really get to the bottom of what's going on and build a relationship with them so that we don't end up there. Let's not end up there, you know? Let's try fix things way before that point. And that's kind of like what 
I feel like is one of my bigger, I guess one of my biggest success stories is that that relationship building in order to ensure uh, students are successful here. Because like I, like you said, like we still feel like we don't belong. So, and we wanna give them every opportunity and advantage that they can grab. And that includes access to somebody like me on campus, you know? Um, the fact that I'm in trouble and I need I need help. What do I do? Who do I go to? You know, it's not just some random email. It's Jackie, you know, if you're in the Faculty of Arts specifically. And then of course, they, there is always First People's House as well. That is for every other faculty. I'm very dedicated to ensuring that Indigenous students succeed while here at university. And that's like a huge passion of mine because I barely made it through. <laughs> I'm not going to let that happen to others. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, thank goodness you made it through, Jackie. <laughs> and, oh uh, my God, so much um, for the ways in which you take care of the students and, and love them and care for them and that whole anti-network that you've got going on. And one piece that stands out is also your relatability. Like they come to you because they can relate to you. And so, so grateful for um, everything you do for the success of, of our students. And that's an inspiration for all of us, wherever we are, right? I often think about, yeah, I'm some students like, yeah, it's, I'm the auntie. And as you said, and I often say, it's like, we need more aunties, mm -hmm. right? And thank goodness we have the role models of those before, those here now, and then fostering that as a strong community. So hi, hi, and merci for everything you do and for everything you continue to do. And I want to come to your genealogy mm -hmm. workshop. Mm -hmm. and thank you, Pamela, for joining us as a co-host. What a great conversation, and we could carry on yeah, it's about supporting the students and where I come from and what I have learned in my life and my all my different roles that I've had and my upbringing and my community has led me to this point here where I am. And that is to help students succeed and get their post-secondary and get their degree because we need more students with their degrees. We, Indigenous people need to be, have their degrees, to be able to change the system and work with, work from inside to dismantle the system. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean though, like yeah. we need to just make sure our students succeed. And thank you guys for having me. I'm really glad I came and did this today. Thanks, Jackie. It's been so great getting to know you a little bit more and just seeing the so many similarities that we have in our experience. And I just love this pop for that reason. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha.